We are speaking to Professor Leonard Ogaro of St. Vincent, the Anthony and Sabga Caribbean Awards for Excellence Laureate in Science and Technology for 2012. Professor Ogaro is a geneticist and a plant pathologist, one of the leading figures in implementing the Caribbean's biotechnology and biosafety protocols. Welcome, Professor Ogaro. Thank you very much. Uh, so you are a geneticist initially. Yes, still, still am. Uh -huh. um, so my my PhD training is in in genetics, and I came into plant pathology um, through the back door, in in a sense, um, primarily because at the time when I had completed my PhD program and came back to the Caribbean, so I'd done quite quite a bit of work in the UK with mm -hmm. um, a supervisor there. Mm -hmm. I was looking for areas where I might be able to uh, apply my skills mm -hmm. and uh, it turned out that agriculture being the primary productive sector for most of the countries was, 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 was a good fit. Mm. So, I, so I started working, um, applying genetics to, to agriculture from the standpoint of, of, of using um, genes or genetic, genetic elements to improve the resistance of, 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 of crop plants mm -hmm. to diseases which, which infect them. But most scientists, uh, when you hear research scientists, you think many abstract things. Uh, it, it, is it usual for a scientist to be so interested in practical things? Um, yes, well, certainly um, for me, I, I, I do not make distinctions between what some people call basic research and, and applied research because the basic research that, 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 that I've done, and I've done quite a bit of it, it's always with the, 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 the objective of understanding something a little better and to discover new tools and techniques which you can apply. Mm -hmm. And in many instances, a lot of the new innovations and, and new technologies would come out of the basic research. And I think I was perhaps very fortunate that I was able to, to do both. One of the things about the educational system in the Caribbean and worldwide is that there's a falling off of interest in science, but yet you went against the, the norm and you were interested in science. How did this, lo how did this love and interest mm -hmm. in science develop? I'm not quite sure, but I certainly can recall even in my childhood years that um, my parents in particular, in the inner family circles, have often thought that I was special based on my performance at school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I certainly enjoy their admiration and affection very much and continue to do well just for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. So when I got into the time when, when I needed to concentrate on, on, on a career, I, I did it the same way. So um, I concentrated on things primarily just to have fun. You were born in, um, in St. Vincent? Yes, I was born in St. Vincent in Kingstown, but grew up in rural St. Vincent during my childhood years with, with, with grandparents. Mm -hmm. yes. And you, um, you were a scholarship student to yes. St. Vincent Grammar School? Yes, I've always been very fortunate in the sense that I've always um, won scholarships at the various stages of, of my education. So I won a scholarship to um, secondary school, and from my A-level results, I also obtained a scholarship to the University of the West Indies, it's at the Cable campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, towards the end of my bachelor's program there, um, my professors felt that perhaps, um, you know, I might be a useful researcher and uh, they even arranged um, for uh, a full scholarship for me mm -hmm. 
to pursue uh, my postgraduate studies. So You've done work that is of direct relevance to a lot of food crops in the Caribbean. Yes. Uh, tell us a little about that. Well, um, the first major food crop that I worked on um, was when I arrived at the UWI as a lecturer and had learned at that time that the Barbados government was trying to establish onion cultivation on a commercial scale, both for local consumption and export. So they were really putting a lot of resources in, 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 into onion production. But very early in their efforts, the fields became affected by, by disease. So this was their single, the most important constraint at the time. And uh, had a delegation from the Ministry of Agriculture asking me whether or not I can provide some research support. And, and was quite glad to, 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 to take it on because I, that time too, I was really looking for ways in which I can, I can have impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, it went well in the sense that um, it, it hadn't been too difficult to sort out. And within two years, we were able to identify the, the, the cause of the infestation. And also, in response to that, had identify onion varieties which, which were more resistant. And, and they became the, the, the backbone of the onion industry. And up to this day, um, onion is, is a major commercial crop in, in, in Barbados. Okay, and you have also done work that affects uh, yams, papayas, peppers, and so on? Yes, um, certainly with the yams, again, this is a, another crisis situation I was brought in to help with. Um, the, and mainly in the Barbadian landscape, again, for this setting, where um, a particular yam type called white Lisbon yam, um, after a while, certainly in the 80s, it, it was impossible to grow it because it, it, it was just totally destroyed by, by disease. Again, very fortunate um, within a short span of two years, we were able to reestablish commercial cultivation. So now you have um, you've moved on to areas of biotechnology and biosafety. Could you tell us a little bit about the bios? Uh, everyone is interested in genetically modified foods. And this is one of the areas that you're working in now. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about your work with GM foods? With modern biotechnology relying on genetic engineering, essentially um, what one does is to um, move genes or genetic elements, usually from one species, or in this case, life form, to another life form if the understanding is that the transfer will, will be of some agronomic significance mm -hmm. in, in, in the crop type. And uh, you can improve crops that way because the crops do not have all of the attributes to face all of the challenges that they're exposed to. But some of the attributes which can help crops are in other life forms, mm. be it bacteria, insects, and so okay. forth. So the, Is there some element of danger in this? Um, there are concerns about, about the use of the technology in this way. Um, I think maybe first and foremost, um, one needs to recognize that um, in the traditional way of, of breeding, um, as, as, as one would often say, it's between like and like. So you, so um, genes from dogs could only be transformed to other dogs, but the techniques of genetic engineering has obliterated that barrier. So you can have genes moving from any life form to another. Now, the, the root of the concerns has to do with the fact that one is creating new life forms that we've never seen before. One is not quite so sure how these life forms that have been created in this way 
will behave when they get into the environment. Um, genetic engineering or mod the, this modern biotechnology technique has the potential of bringing foreign proteins into the food chain. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, humans may not have um, consumed um, proteins from a particular bacterium before because it's not being a food source. Mm -hmm. But by transferring um, genetic elements from that bacterium to a plant because it does some good, then essentially you're transferring that the protein too in, 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 into the food supply. And one is not quite sure how the human system reacts to it because it's not being accustomed to dealing or digesting or processing these foreign materials. So there, there are some concerns. And uh, as a, these concerns are being recognized, and uh, as a result, um, countries have gotten together um, to come up with an international agreement called the Carter Unit Protocol on Biosafety, which the intention is to regulate trade in modern biotechnology products, particularly the ones that are uh, intended for introduction into the environment, for example, seeds for planting. Mm -hmm to assess them for various levels of risk before they're, they're introduced. So the, that's the essence of the, the biosafety program. And your most recent employment, uh, you've returned to UWI yes. as the senior international consultant on biotechnology and biosafety. Yes. Now we know what biotechnology and biosafety are from what you've just said, but I understand your new job also includes looking at climate change and its effects on the food supply? Um, my interest, particularly when I joined the, the United Nations as, 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 as one of the global managers of the biosafety program, was to see to what extent I can align my work more closely with global trends and resources for greater impact on carbon agriculture. The issue which we have to um, deal with would be the impact of, of climate change, and in my particular case, on agriculture. Uh, climate change is, is anticipated to bring changes to the farming environment. So if conditions change, we don't quite know whether or not the crop types we grow now mm -hmm. will, will be suitable in this change environment. So one has to be able to apply the research and the science to be able to make the change if and when the need arises. Global environments are changing very quickly. How well prepared is the Caribbean to move with these changes? Not, not well prepared. They have signed um, many conventions and so forth, but there the, are the issues with respect to capacity um, to, to build this. But just also let me just backtrack a little bit because it's really not just the, the um, some of the, the long-term changes. Um, we still have to be concerned about changes in the short, medium, and long term in the agricultural arena. Um, because I have made the point um, that commercial agriculture, as, as we know it, is, is, a, is a human construct, it's a, it's a man made invention, and more particularly, it's a creature of science and technology. So you have to apply science and technology at all times to, to stay with it. And the, the moment you cease to, to remove it from, from that scenario, then you're not keeping up with changes in the environment which require a different response. 
So you, you need to look at it, look at the short-term changes, the medium-term changes, and the long-term changes. The long-term changes can be very important and take place over a long time. So for example, um, agriculture, commercial agriculture, is a very extractive process. It takes a lot from the soil, particularly over time. So the soil that you work with now was not the same as it was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the issue then is how do I continue to make the soil workable and, and productive? We may understand some of the issues with respect to the application of fertilizer and so on, but it would be a lot more than that. So you, you need the, the science and technology to unearth these issues to be able to, to, to plan forward. And, and, and the issue with climate change um, complicates it because um, some over long term again and how you track all of these things. So you, you really need to continue with the application of science and technology if you want to stay in commercial agriculture. Because if you apply um, 1950s science and technology, you're going to get results for that, that time. Okay, uh, well, we have been speaking to Professor Leonard Ogaro, the Anthony N. Sabga Caribbean Awards for Excellence Laureate in Science and Technology for 2012. Professor Ogaro, thank you for your time and your knowledge.